2001 on a snowy Baltimore night in a hospital in a darkened corner of the ICU, Josie King, an 18-month-old girl who looked just like my daughter, was taken off of life support and died in her mother's arms. She died of a catheter infection. Now, these aren't exotic conditions. In 2001, they killed over 30,000 people a year. That's about as many people as died from breast or prostate cancer. But at the time, every clinician had been taught that these infections are inevitable. That sometimes little girls like Josie are going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. After she died, her mother Sorel came up to me and said, Peter, could you tell me that this won't happen to my other daughters? And I said, no, I can't. Because that's where the environment of medicine had led me. But then she said something else. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to knock down this closed door? And in that moment, I knew I couldn't say no ever again. Not to Sorel, not to anybody. Here's the story of how we tried to answer her question and what we learned along the way. Our mastery of the world has never been greater than it is right now. How amazing? Well, last year we started printing body parts using a 3D printer. That's how amazing. But when little girls like Josie still suffer and die from things that we've known how to prevent for decades, then we have a problem that technology isn't solving. And Josie's not alone, and catheter infections aren't the only issue. Medical error is the third leading cause of death. It took my father when he was my age. Diagnostic errors, communication errors, infections, blood clots are all major killers. And what they have in common is that none of it has to happen. The problem isn't in what we know. The problem is in how we put it into practice. Our science needs to dig a little deeper to a place where science normally doesn't go. My colleagues at Johns Hopkins and I decided to push back against this environment to question what we've been taught was impossible. To develop our intervention, we turned to transdisciplinary research, where scientists mash up ideas from different disciplines, align them to pull multiple levers to move the needle in a big, big way. And in doing so, we took on a problem that every force in medicine said was impossible. We started with the goal of eliminating infections and believing we could. We created a checklist of best practice and made it easy to use the checklist. We fed data back into the system to identify gaps in care and to create accountability from board to bedside. We created connected communities to link doctors and nurses from diverse hospitals so that they could believe in each other and belong to a community. We spread this program state by state across the U.S. and connected states so they could believe and belong together. And today, through the efforts of many, these infections are down over 80%. Time Magazine, <laughs> thanks. Time Magazine and The New Yorker Magazine said this intervention, the checklist, may have saved more lives than any other basic science discovery of the last decade. But the checklist isn't the whole story. Indeed, there wasn't one checklist. We encouraged every hospital to make their own. And they're 90% the same, but that 10% difference is what made it work. And every one of them thinks theirs is the best and it was for their culture. You see, we learned that things done to others rather than with them are highly resisted. They're usually never implemented locally. And if they do, they rarely work. The goal wasn't to follow directions. The goal is to eliminate infections. It's not about the checklist. 
It's about saving a life. We learned that the secret sauce of this intervention was believing that anything is possible and belonging to a connected community. And if thought leaders like you could begin to carry this beyond medicine, imagine what's possible. See, we understood that there's the problems themselves, but then there's the perceptions of how we think about the problems. Research from psychology and anthropology tell us that there's the potential, uh, there's, there's the problem of human perceptions, and then there's the problem of how we go about thinking about human potential. For example, in 1956, when Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, leading scientist at the time said it was impossible. By the way, he did it as a medical student, go tribe, that he would die trying. Well, he didn't die when he did that, and, and you may know that about Bannister, but what you may not know is the next year, following his example, 12 more people broke this record. Many of our limits are not in what we can do, but in what we think we can do. The belief that catheter infections were a fact of life was not a fact, not a fact, it was just a belief. Not a fact, not a fact at all. Many of our limits of human achievement could be stripped away, but only if we put possibility above those limits. Well, how do you create that kind of environment in the world? Well, we need to do two things. Number one, get some humility. Your culture has to be humble and curious and trusting enough to allow you to question even the most basic narrative of your profession. When Josie died, it was ingrained in the culture of medicine, not just at Hopkins, but everywhere, that this kind of tragedy was just part of the landscape. The goal isn't to preserve the system, it should be to solve a problem regardless of the system, even if that means throwing out the system. Improving should be our priority, not shaming, not judging, not blaming. Number two, create connected communities. If you're gonna solve big problems in the world, you need a structure to support the work. You need vertical connections to create accountability. Yes, we absolutely need accountability, but accountability works through coercion, and that only takes you so far. You also need inspiration. And when it comes to motivating professionals to get things done, seek to inspire rather than coerce. To find that structure, we turn to nature, to a fractal. The power of fractals comes from their peers' connections, from doing things with rather than to others. In our case, it was these peer connections that allowed clinicians to gain the insights to say, these infections are preventable and we can do something about it. It allowed them to tell a new story. Now, that's not the way the world works today, but it ought to. You see, we need a very personal change to the way we go about designing and implementing solutions to our biggest problems. I call it believing and belonging. Technology is wonderful, but it can only take us so far. The environment has to take us the rest of the way. The environment of believing and belonging. And this is true beyond medicine. In the classroom, Yuri Traceman taught first year math at UC Berkeley. And he noticed that underserved African American students were failing introductory math class more than whites and Asians. He looked into it and found out, for example, that failing students studied alone, while successful students studied together. Those students were getting far more than the answers to their problems. The education they were getting was exactly the same, but the environment was entirely different. They were getting the support of the group, contagious confidence from working together. So he changed the environment to one of believing and belonging. He even gave it a name. He called it an honors program because through that name, he was telling those students that they mattered, 
that he believed in them. The checklist was the same, study hard, study long, but that would never be enough. It needed to come through in an environment of believing and belonging. He kept the intervention, but he replaced the failing narrative that surrounded it. And within a year, the success rates of those students were exactly the same as the rest. Now, imagine how much better the world would be if we encouraged that kind of environment amongst those who have the power and the privilege to create it. Doctors and directors, parents and principals, congressmen and community leaders, teachers and techies, in every segment of society, education, science, business, government. You see, we all crave an atmosphere of trust and accepting it, getting it, allows us to think of more solutions that reach more people more often. Believing and belonging is a catalyst for life-saving interventions. So as I close, how do we make believing and belonging a thing in the real world? Psychologist Barbara Friedrichsen provides us the secret sauce. She calls it micro-moments of positive resonance. But there's a simpler word for it. She calls it love. Still, small moments of caring when one person connects warmly with another. A warm welcome when you walk in the door. A sincere greeting to a colleague. A few moments listening to a friend's ideas. A gentle hand on a worried patient a respectful smile to a homeless person. You can't just throw up a checklist and say we're safe here. We don't change culture on command. The reason love matters is because you're only gonna go that extra mile if you're doing it for somebody you love. And even if you don't really love them, if you act like you do, pretty soon you will. <laughs> a big change is, a, is the sum of a thousand small ones, facilitated by a thousand micro moments. Change progresses at the speed of trust. Believing and belonging builds trust. We don't have to wait for some executive to give us authority to do this, not the president, not Congress, not your CEO. It begins when you and I begin to live this way question is, are we humble enough to change ourselves? If we want to save lives in medicine and improve lives in education, in government, in business, we have to remember that even the smallest act of love opens the door a little more. It's time we come together to throw that door wide open. Thank you.